Welcome to part three in topic two on polymer structures. In this part of the lecture, we're going to focus on structures of polymers in the solid state. And we can generally organize solid state microstructures into glassy states and crystalline states. Let's start with the glassy states, which are typically a little bit simpler to comprehend. First of all, the picture on the left shows a computer simulation of what a polyethylene um, structure would look like in the glassy state, solid state. Some things that you can observe from this are that there are no polymer bundles of chains that are parallel to each other. All the polymer chains seem to cross one another at 90 degree angles. As you can see here, for example, where one chain crosses the other at a 90 degree angle, and as well over here where it crosses at a 90 degree angle. In addition to that, the carbon-carbon bond angles only seem to influence one another over a distance of about one nanometer. So there's a high degree of contortion and twisting and kinking of the polymer chain. And it turns out that these observations are generally in line with what we call the frozen random coil model of glassy polymers. That we imagine the polymer to be a random coil or contorted bowl of spaghetti that's simply frozen in space to form the glassy microstructure. It's also important to recognize that glassy microstructures have relatively low density. In fact, the density of a glassy material is about 88% of that of a crystalline material. That's true for both polyethylene and polytetrafluoroethylene, both relatively simple polymers. Now, crystalline structures are a bit more complicated. This is the polyethylene unit cell, which is orthorhombic. Orthorhombic means that the three dimensions, A, B, and C, are not equal to each other, but the angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, are all 90 degrees. If we look down the B axis of the orthorhombic unit cell, we can see the chains are lined up parallel to one another and are lined up in alignment with the C axis, which is this dimension right here. If we look down the C axis, we can see that the polymer's chains are stacked in such a way within a plane that the atoms are perpendicular to each other. The carbon-carbon bond here is perpendicular to the carbon-carbon bond here in the center. And that that structure alternates back and forth. You can see the orientation here of, of the carbon-carbon bond is this way. And then it flips 90 degrees in the center molecule and then flips back 90 degrees in the far upper right corner again. Now this is the simplest polymer, polyethylene, and so it has an orthorhombic crystal structure which is relatively high degree of, um, of symmetry. But for other polymers like polypropylene, which is a more complex mer, we have a lower level of symmetry for being that polypropylene is a triclinic um, crystal structure. Now the polyethylene molecule, when it organizes itself into the crystal, forms a zigzag of the carbon atoms back and forth where all of the MERS units are in the trans conformation. And you have a bond angle of 112 degrees between two adjacent carbon-carbon bonds. And as I mentioned before, the, the molecular chains are oriented parallel to the C-axis of the molecule. And if we look at the structure down the C-axis, we'll see that the hydrogen atoms are tucked into the spaces between two carbon, or excuse me, two polyethylene molecules. This is the lowest possible energy state for the system. Polytetrafluoroethylene, however, forms a slightly different molecule. Now remember that in polytetrafluoroethylene is very similar to polyethylene. All you're doing is replacing the hydrogen atoms with fluorine atoms, but because of the large electronegative charge on the uh, um, fluorine atoms, they repel one another and this causes a slight helical rotation of the poly, polytetrafluoroethylene molecule. So you can see as you look down the side of the chain, you get gradually a rotation of the atoms. And you can see this rotation here in this vertical view looking down the chain as well. It turns out this helical pattern is very common in natural polymers, which tend to have more polarity than synthetic polymers. So how do semi-crystalline polymers organize themselves? Well, first we have the basic unit cell, which is orthorhombic in the case of polyethylene. Unit cells organize into lamellae, which are about 10 to 20 nanometers thick and about one micron long or and wide. So here's a picture of a lamellae, 
here, and you can see that the chains run through the lamellae, and then you have amorphous sections of the chain which wrap around the outside of the lamellae and reconnect into the lamellae somewhere else. A typical polyethylene molecule would extend approximately 90 nanometers, much larger than an individual lamellae, so this suggests that that individual molecule must exit the lamellae at some point, form an amorphous section, and then and fold over and then return back into the same lamellae, or possibly extend into another lamellae. So the lamellae are connected to one another by amorphous sections of these polymer chains. Branched regions of the polyethylene are rejected by the lamellae, and the reason for this is because the branched sections of the chain are difficult to fold and or coordinate into this orthorhombic unit cell. So they tend to be they tend to stick outside the lamellae and limit the the uh, dimensions of the lamellae, and therefore limit the amount of crystallinity found in the polymer. Now the lamellae radiate outward, as shown in this picture from a single origin point, a growth point, in the lamellar structure. Ultimately they form a sphere-like structure that looks very similar to a grain but is not, uh, does not grow according to uh, crystallographic orientation but rather by radiating outward from a single point. This structure is known as a spherulite and spherulites are about 50 to 500 micrometers in diameter. As I mentioned, spherulites are not single crystals as grains are in metals. Rather, they're a stacking of these individual lamellae that are radiating out from the center. Spherulites actually grow in this radial pattern as individual lamellae form by nucleating in the gaps between the previous two lamellae. So here we have a series of lamellae radiating out from a single point. And we can see that as they spread out, they form gaps between themselves. So another lamellae will grow into that gap and so on and it will gradually spread out until eventually it forms a sphere-like shape. This is what a lamellae looks like in cross-polarized light. You can see that it has a sort of a grain boundary like structure similar to that found in metals. The Maltese cross is indicative of the fact that there's anisotropic um, light refraction in the orthobrombic crystal structure. Now, spherulites result in relatively high polymer density because they are tightly packing the molecular chains together. And they usually only occur in homopolymers, meaning polymers that are made entirely of one type of MER structure, because that's, that MER structure, when you only have one MER structure, you have a simpler um, organization of the polymer and you're more likely to form a crystal structure. More common, though, is the fact that because you have a spherulite, um, and you have lamellae stacked together, you're going to have some region where the polymer molecule is not able to be organized into the crystal and is therefore amorphous. So you end up with a semi-crystalline material. This picture represents a nearly 100% crystalline structure. It's much more common to have a polymer that's 50 to 70% crystalline. Percent crystallinity, by the way, can be measured by two different techniques an indirect method called the density measurement method and then also by comparing the heat of fusion of the crystalline material to a sample of material. Let's look at the density method first. In the density method the percent crystallinity is equal to 1 minus the density of an amorphous polymer of that type divided by the density of the sample that you're interested in all divided by 1 minus the density of the amorphous material divided by the density of the crystalline material. So for example, the density of an amorphous material is point, uh, amorphous polyethylene is 0.854 grams per cubic centimeter and the density of the crystalline material is almost 1 gram per cubic centimeter. So you insert the density of your sample and you can calculate the percent crystallinity of that sample. The more common method is using differential scanning calorimetry, uh, which tends to be more accurate. DSC measures the variation in specific heat with respect to temperature, as we described before. Sudden increases in the specific heat suggest a microstructural transformation, for example, a crystalline structure turning into a melt. The area above the baseline, or the flat line of the heat flow, indicates the heat of fusion. So in other words, the area underneath this spike indicates the heat of fusion for turning a crystalline polypropylene into a polypropylene melt. So if I run a sample in my DSC and I see a peak like this, an endotherm, then I take the area of that endotherm and divide it by the area of the endotherm for a perfectly crystalline sample of polypropylene. And 